Welcome along to another webinar and this time we're going to be looking at modifications we can make to a factory wet sump lubrication system in order to provide a cost effective upgrade that's going to help keep a competition engine alive. Particularly this is a big problem for cars that are run hard on a racetrack. So one of the problems we find is that when we start modifying any vehicle, particularly when we start modifying the suspension, adding stickier tyres, wider tyres etc, the ability for that car to pull higher levels of lateral g-force as well as for that matter higher levels of g-force longitudinally in both braking and acceleration do increase. Now the problem with this is as we're increasing the ability to corner, brake and accelerate harder, the factory oiling system generally is not going to be designed to cope with those forces. And the problem with this is when we start getting the oil sloshing away from the oil pickup inside our sump, we end up with the potential for the oil pickup to draw air and that's going to almost instantly result in bearing failure inside our engine. So this is probably in my experience one of the most common causes I see for catastrophic engine failures in cars that are driven hard on the racetrack. It's not just limited to the racetrack though, we can see these same problems crop up when uh, we are driving hard on the street potentially in some cars and also for gravel hill climbs those sorts of things although generally the g-forces aren't quite as great there so uh, not just limited to circuit cars but that's definitely where we see uh, the mainstream problems and if we just jump across to my laptop screen for a moment we've got some data from one of our development cars here that I just wanted to show you so at the top here we've got our engine speed in purple uh, we've got our throttle position below this in green interesting aspect that we've got that's important to this log is in blue we've got our our lateral g-force so this is our cornering force and then we've got our oil temperature which we'll talk about a little bit later in the webinar we can see for this particular lap that's pretty consistent at 103 degrees C and then finally in the bottom group here when in yellow we've got our engine oil pressure and PSI. So our oil pressure generally is linked to our engine RPM, the speed of the oil pump is directly related to our engine RPM so we do tend to see our oil pressure fluctuate naturally with engine RPM that's pretty natural and a good rule of thumb is that we generally want to see around about 10 psi of oil pressure per thousand rpm. Now through the majority of this uh, log we can see we're pretty close to that. The point that I've just randomly grabbed there we've got 65 psi of oil pressure at about 6200 rpm. The concerning aspect here though is within this log file we've got some significant areas where we're seeing drops in our oil pressure and this is indicative of oil surge, this is what we're trying to avoid. Uh, so particularly in this instance here, uh, if we look at what we've got going on, uh, we're dropping all the way down to about 20, 27 psi uh, and that is pretty worrying. Uh, we do need to take into account here that our engine RPM has dropped down as well uh, but we're still at 4600 RPM so not what we want to see. A redeeming feature for this particular uh, lap is that at all of the cases where we have got oil surge, uh, if we look at what we're doing on the throttle, you can see that the driver is actually off the throttle. So this particular point here, the driver's off the throttle, however we can see that we're pulling almost 1G so uh, lots of cornering force but not a lot of throttle and the reason that the engine can live through this is because uh, when we're not on the throttle there's not a lot of load on the bearing so we kind of get a little bit of breather and uh, basically a bit of a get out of jail free card. Uh, likewise we can see exactly the same things happening at this point in our log file we're down here to about 30 32, 34 psi and again we're actually uh, downshifting there so the little blip on the throttle there is just to match revs uh, so we're actually braking and this is, uh, this is we can also see we've still got some lateral g-force going on there. So while uh, there's some significant 
oil surge going on in this particular lap. We've been very fortunate that the positions on the track where we have got that oil surge uh, correspond to uh, areas where we're not applying any load to the engine. But depending on uh, the layout of your track, is just as likely to happen where you are actually at a reasonable level of load. And this is also pretty common to occur in sustained uh, high G-force corners. So if you've got a very long corner, uh, this is a, a really uh, key point where you can run into problems with the oil getting away from the oil pickup. Uh, I should mention here that uh, of course as usual we will be having questions and answers at the end of this webinar so if there's anything that I talk about today please feel free to ask questions and uh, we'll get to those at the end. So when it comes to fixing these problems we have a variety of solutions. Uh, I'm going to deal with the top shelf option which is a full dry sump system. Uh, so if we head across to my laptop screen this is some really nasty shots that I've just taken of our V8 Toyota 86 just before he came live for this webinar so please excuse the mess it's in the middle of some fabrication work uh, but here we are looking at the front of the engine and off to the uh, right hand side of the engine here we've got our dry sump pump. Uh, so the dry sump system basically evacuates all of the oil out of the sump and and forces that to an external oil reservoir which we'll have a look at in a second. So the dry sump pump as we can see we've got a drive hub uh, that is bolted to the front of the crankshaft and the dry sump pump is externally driven via this belt. Now on our next shot this is the uh, interior of the car so this is our dry sump tank here and this is where all of the oil evacuated out of the sump is pumped through to. You can get a variety of different pumps with a different number of stages. We've actually got a pretty basic setup there with a three stage pump uh, but often we'll have uh, multiple scavenge stages, maybe four different scavenge stages and that term scavenge means that's what's drawing the oil and air out of the crankcase of the engine and pumping it back into this tank. And the important part with this tank is the shape of it. You'll notice that it's quite tall and narrow and the pressure supply back into the engine is drawn out of the bottom of this tank. So, oops, that's our pressure supply coming out there. So what it means is basically this tank in normal operation is going to be about two thirds to three quarters full. There's always a good head of oil above the oil pickup, or the uh, pressure oil pickup. Uh, so we're always going to get constant oil supply. The other aspect with these dry sump tanks is that they are also designed to remove aeration from the oil that's being returned. When you're pulling a lot of oil and a lot of air out of the sump, uh, the oil that's being returned is quite highly aerated and we need to get rid of the, the air out of that oil so we are just pumping pure liquid oil back into the engine. Uh, so we've got another shot here, this is from underneath and this shows our dry sump pump here. Uh, so we've got two that are labelled as scavenge, so these are the, the pumps that, the stages of the pump that draw out oil and air out and then at the back of the pump we've got our pressure stage. So this draws that oil from the reservoir, pumps it through our oil cooler, pumps it through our oil filter and then finally into the engine and as an added advantage as well there's an external oil pressure regulator on these pumps so we can actually set our oil pressure uh, with these pumps as well quite easily. Uh, lastly there's an undershot so this is our modified sump uh, again, a pretty basic setup on this particular engine. We see much more elaborate setups with full CNC uh, billet sumps. In this case, it's a simple setup with our two scavenge stages drawing oil out of the sump. So that's what it looks like if you're going for a top shelf setup. Uh, and the problems with that is that there's a lot of cost and a lot of complexity with a dry sump system. It's easy to spend somewhere in the region of three to maybe four thousand US dollars just on the parts for a dry sump system before you even consider route running the system and fitting it to your car. And then on top of that you're also often going to have quite long runs of very expensive abraded AN hose and fittings in order to plumb that system between the pump, the engine, your uh, dry sump tank and also any oil coolers and filters you've got in the system. So great if the budget is there for it and it is the ultimate option. Uh, well set up this will give you very 
reliable oil, a very reliable lubrication system that's not going to present any issues with oil search. However, it is going to be beyond the scope of most people, particularly at the enthusiast level. So what we're going to talk about is what we can do at the enthusiast level, which is modifying our wet sump design instead. So when we're doing this, what we're going to be doing is modifying the sump that bolts to the bottom of our engine and we're going to be designing a new sump to help uh, try and trap oil around the oil pickup and make sure that it's not going to slosh away from that oil pickup under sustained uh, cornering, accelerating or braking forces. So what we obviously need is some way of trapping that oil around the oil pickup. As an added bonus, generally when we are building an aftermarket or modified sump, what we're probably also going to want to do as a matter of course is add some additional oil capacity. Um, now again the oil capacity or adding additional oil capacity is not a silver bullet to fix our lubrication problems but additional oil capacity coupled with uh, proper design with some trap doors around the pickup is definitely going to help us keep that oil where it's supposed to be. Um, the other aspect which is a little bit separate to our sump design but is definitely worth touching on here is we also may need to address the oil return. Uh, so there are a number of engines where there's known problems with the oil under sustained high RPM operation being pumped up into the cylinder head essentially faster than it can be returned back to the sump. Uh, this is a big problem with some of the Nissan RB series engines for example and uh, what this means is at sustained high RPM, which is quite easy to, to get on a racetrack application, uh, we can literally empty the sump. Well, not completely empty the sump, but we're pumping all of the oil out of the sump into the cylinder head. It lowers the oil level in the sump around the pickup, and then it just makes it that much easier for that oil pickup to end up sucking up air under cornering, accelerating, or braking forces. So often, which again, outside of the scope, but just so you are aware of it, uh, you may need to consider restrictors in the in the engine block so that less oil is pumped up to the head. Uh, you may also want to look at fitting external oil drains from the cylinder head uh, back into the sump just to help all of that flow return. Uh, there are other engines where uh, common modifications include drilling out the oil return galleries in the block oversize. Uh, maybe some of them may also need some smoothing or essentially porting to again just help that oil to flow back. So what we're going to have a look at here is the uh, sump that I designed and built for our Toyota 86 to help eliminate that problem that we just looked at. So uh, there's all of those design elements that I took into account with the, the sump. So we started here uh, with the factory sump and I wanted to add some capacity into this and you'll quite often see this where uh, there's a lot of aftermarket sumps that are available off the shelf for popular engines where the sump will be winged so uh, basically wings on the sump are added to add to that capacity. We're a little bit limited on the Toyota 86 because we don't have a lot of room around the headers uh, so this was designed uh, to quite tightly fit around our turbo headers and our up pipe uh, giving us a little bit of additional capacity. It's also a little bit deeper so it sits a little bit deeper than stock uh, to add to that capacity. When you are at making the sump deeper than stock you do obviously need to be mindful of clearance to uh, the ground. Uh, really it's not a good idea to have your sump as the lowest part of your car. It would be nice if the sump was protected by a cross member or something of that nature or at least a sump guard below it. So that's the first aspect and what I did with this is it's basically a range of, uh, of laser cut steel plates that I designed. I made a mock up just using cardboard so there's not a lot of technology in this, it's not 3D modelled or anything of that nature, it's all just basic hand tools, cutting out pieces of cardboard with some scissors to get the right shapes and once I was comfortable with that we had all of those, uh, all of those plates laser cut. Uh, now once that was done they've all been TIG welded and we've been we've then cut out the rest of the sump so that the uh, that that's got full access to the wing section that we've just created. Now that on its own is not really going to be a lot of help uh, inside that sump there's nothing currently to stop our oil from sloshing away so we need a little bit more uh, than just our wing sump and this is where 
the baffle box comes in and this is really the key to designing a baffled sump. Again we've got a couple of CNC, uh, sorry, um, laser cut plates that are the, the basis of this. What we'll do is we'll have a look under our overhead camera to start with and then I'll try and get a little bit of a close up using our iPhone camera here. So we've got a plate that is designed to bolt into our sump. i have got some holes so we can bolt that in. There's a couple of oil returns and these are a factory part of the FA20 sump that we've needed to incorporate. In the centre we've got a 3 inch tube uh, and this is where our oil pickup sits. So we've got some little cutouts here which clear that oil pickup and I'll just grab that oil pickup so basically that's going to sit inside that tube so the idea of that tube is that it prevents the oil sloshing away so let's turn that over and we'll have a closer look all right I think we should be able to see that and again we'll just go to our iPhone camera in a second so we've got our inner tube there this comes down and seals essentially right against the base of the sump and we've got four little cutout uh, slots in this so this allows the oil to come into our central pickup the important point is that these are all on angles so uh, if we're looking at the sump and cornering the oil is going to want to move left or right uh, and braking acceleration we're going to be moving this way so in all of those directions we've actually got a hard wall that oil can't get out then on the outside of the box we've got another or the outside of the the um, sump we've got this square box made up which includes some little trap doors so let's just jump across to our iPhone camera and we'll see if we can get a better look at these so again uh, we've got no that's not going to work I'll try this We've got the central tube that we can see with those slots that I've just explained to you. We've got the four of them, remembering that they aren't in line with our cornering, acceleration and braking directions. And then we've got our external box. And the key point with this is we've got these little rubber trap doors. So these rubber trap doors are designed so that they're on the inside of the box. So we've got this big round hole that allows the oil to flow through directly above the hole here or below in our, the way I've got this set up, there's a slot that these rubber trap doors locate in. And the idea there is that the trap doors will allow the oil to flow into our central baffle box, but if under accelerating or braking or, or uh, cornering forces, uh, if the oil sloshes to try and come out of that central baffle box, it's actually going to close those trap doors against the uh, plate that they're located in. And while at the moment, uh, obviously room temperature, these trap doors uh, seem a little bit hard, uh, particularly when the engine is at operating temperature and the oil temperature is up above maybe 80, 90 degrees, these are nice and pliable, so they do a really good job of seeing. So this is a really good way of improving our wet sump design. Uh, we're going to get much more stable uh, oil pressure. We're not going to have as much risk of that oil running away from the oil pickup. Um, but that is only one option that we can go through. So we'll talk about another option in a second. So basically how this all goes together, if we get our iPhone out of the way, we'll just jump across to, oh actually, let's have a, a better look at the inside of our sump with our iPhone camera. Uh, so again, we can see how the sump has been cut out uh, to make way for the extension that we've added in. And we've got these little mounting tabs that are welded in, they're TIG welded in, uh, just to allow us to bolt that baffle box in place. And we can actually see how tightly that fits we can see a match mark in the bottom of the sump which is where that baffle box has been sitting I'll just turn that sump over as well so you can get a better idea of the design of it this is the oil drain obviously pretty important to still be able to get our oil out and we have put on some heat proof wrap there uh, just to protect the the sump the head is actually run directly across the front of this uh, and I'll just turn that over. So this has all just been powder coated black as well. So pretty basic. And uh, essentially I, I won't bolt it in completely, but uh, essentially if we want to locate the, the sump in there, the baffle box in there, uh, it just all sits in there, presses in place, and then gets bolted in. 
Uh, it was also worth mentioning there that the two factory oil returns that I did just briefly touch on, so those actually are returned straight into the centre of that baffle box just to make sure uh, that all of the oil coming back out of the heads uh, is returned into the centre so that again just help helping keep a constant supply of oil around our pickup. Uh, now. One thing you're probably wondering is where do we get these rubber trap doors? Uh, so the ones that we have used on that particular sump are a product that Cosworth make. And if you search, because obviously depending on whereabouts you are in the world, uh, there's going to be a variety of suppliers out there. Uh, if you search, just do a Google search for Cosworth uh, trap door, rubber trap door, sump, something of that nature, uh, a quick Google search uh, before gave me about a dozen suppliers so pretty easy to find. They're priced around about three to five dollars per trap door, per, per rubber trap door, so uh, not particularly expensive. And what you really want to do with that is uh, have the mounting plate that they're going to press into laser cut. Uh, so all it has is a little thin slot that the trap door pull, uh, is located in and uh, you just pull that trap door into that little slot and it'll positively locate in there so it can't ever get out. So that's my preferred technique, uh, but it does require a little bit of effort to actually make all of that, and it's definitely not going to be for everyone. So another option that uh, is available, and these are quite a lot more common, if we go across to my laptop screen, uh, we've got the likes of this Tomei uh, sump for the SR20, and we're actually running something really similar on our SR20. Uh, our one comes from Moroso, and unfortunately I didn't take any photos of it before we mounted it. But again, we can see that on both ends of the sump we've got these wings to add capacity. Uh, to add a little bit of complexity the SR20 is mounted on a bit of an angle so we can see that the sump is also angled so essentially that's designed so that the bottom of the sump is parallel to the ground with the engine installed on its normal angle. And then what we've got is these plates that are located in the sump uh, either side of the pickup and these have just got a little hinged trap door so this is all just made out of uh, stainless steel and essentially the trap door can open in towards the oil pickup uh, but of course if the oil tries to flow away from the oil pickup that trap door is going to close and keep that oil where it's supposed to be and uh, just another one that I quickly found here which is sort of pretty much goes without saying this is kind of what we're trying to do uh, when the car is accelerating uh, it stops that oil from ending up moving across away from the pickup. This is another shot actually of those little trap doors, so exactly the same thing there. And uh, while it probably didn't, may, maybe wasn't that easy to understand when I explained it, uh, the trap door we can see here has got a little tab on it, and this is what locates through the laser cut plate that we make. So we've got a little slot, and that little tab just locates, and we just pull that through, uh, and it's basically got a little recess on it so once we've pulled it through it stays put it can't move. So uh, we're going to move into some questions and answers shortly if you do have any questions about the topic please ask those in the comments and we'll get into those really shortly. Now there is a little bit more to improving your oil the reliability of your oiling system than just your sump design though. Uh, other things you need to consider is your oil temperature and this is another area where factory car really fall down uh, when they are driven hard on a racetrack. Factory cars aren't designed for continuous high RPM, high load operation which is what we get on the racetrack so it's not uncom uncommon to take a car out on the racetrack, measure the oil temperature and find out that it's reaching 130, 140 or maybe even higher uh, when you've done a few laps. So I'm talking degrees C there as well for those who are working in Fahrenheit. Sorry I can't swap over in my head but uh, definitely hotter than I'd like to see. Generally my sort of rough guide is I'd like to have my oil temperature somewhere between about 100 and maybe 115 degrees C. Uh, we don't want it running too cold but the bigger problem for us uh, on competition in competition use is running too too hot. So a common upgrade there is to fit an oil cooler. The problem is as our temp 
the temperature of the oil increases, uh, the oil essentially becomes thinner and it, it can in some instances break down as well and it doesn't do as good a job of lubricating. So it's another common reason why we are going to see bearing failures in a competition engine. So an oil cooler is an essential addition there. We want to also have some way of monitoring our oil temperature and just making sure that whatever we've fitted uh, is going to work. Now of course we can instrument our sump with an oil temperature sensor and maybe have a, a gauge or run that into an ECU or a dash. Uh, if you aren't in that situation where you've got that sort of sensor, a really cheap and easy way is to use an external uh, oil uh, external temperature electrical temperature gauge. Uh, I've I've got one that is basically like a multimeter. It's got a plug-in K-type thermocouple that's nice and thin, and you can literally just put this down the dipstick hole when you come into the pits. And it's going to give you a pretty good snapshot of what your oil temperature is. So uh, a bit cheaper and easier than actually fitting a permanent uh, oil temperature sensor. The other aspect of course is the grade of oil that you're using. Uh, so with our Toyota 8.6 in stock form it's a naturally aspirated 200 horsepower engine and uh, in stock form it is designed to run with a 0W20 oil which is incredibly thin and this is something we see is quite common with very late model engines because uh, the manufacturer is trying to improve the fuel efficiency of the engine uh, by reducing the uh, power power lost to the lubricant in the engine. However, that's maybe not the best option for us if we're looking at actually getting really good protection of the bearings inside the engine. Uh, so quite often I will, in that situation, step up to a slightly thicker oil. And in this case, we've tried a variety of oils on our 8.6 and we're running a 10W40 full synthetic oil from Motul and uh, found that that gives us a nice improvement in our oil pressure and the uh, oil is uh, superior to the factory rated oil in terms of it's going to give more protection to the bearing surfaces. So basically anything that you can do that's going to improve the the chances of your bearings living, uh, it's going to actually be pretty cheap insurance. All right, we'll head across and we'll have a look at some questions now. If you've got any more, please continue to ask them. Uh, Michael has asked, can you comment on the usefulness of an oil accumulator as a solution to oil starvation? Okay, uh, good question Michael, and it's probably something I should have dealt with during this webinar. Um, so I haven't personally had a lot of experience with uh, products such as AccuSump. Um, in a way, I kind of, I guess I feel that they're a bit of a band-aid, but I also do know that a lot of people do use them with pretty good success. Uh, I just can't comment from a personal experience standpoint, so it makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, the idea, though, is that that accumulator is going to uh, basically store pressurized oil, and if we do get an oil pressure drop, it's going to open up and basically supply pressurized oil back into the engine. The problem I have with this, and again not coming from personal experience, just the way uh, I sort of think about this product, is it's sort of going to work after the case of the oil pressure dropping initially. And what I'd probably prefer to do is actually prevent the oil pressure dropping at all. If our oil pressure doesn't drop, then of course we don't need the accumulator. So it's kind of, a, in, a, in a way, I feel like a little bit of a band-aid fix there. Uh, Baz has asked, where is the oil pressure being measured from? Pre-filter, post-filter, or somewhere off the block? 70 psi max pressure, 27 psi oil pressure, would love to compare to my engine. Okay, so the oil pressure being measured there is actually from the factory location, and as is common on most engines, this is essentially the point where the oil uh, goes into the main oil galleries. So that's the most relevant point. Uh, of course, if we're measuring pre-oil filter, uh, we're likely to get a pressure drop across the filter and the numbers aren't going to be particularly realistic. Uh, also mentioned there, on our Toyota 86, when we were first testing it without the uh, aftermarket oil cooler we fitted, so no oil cooler at all, we're getting about 137 degrees C oil temperature, uh, running on the rated 0W20 oil back when it was naturally aspirated, uh, we were seeing maximum oil pressure on the racetrack only reaching about 45 to 50 psi, so pretty scary stuff. Uh, the 70 psi we were seeing there was, was with our 10W40 oil. 
Uh, Jay has asked, I'll be building a B18C engine sometime this year. Morosso offers a 5.5 quart oil pan with a removable sump tray, magnetic drain plug, etc. Are these oil pans good? Are they sure are expensive. Also, why would someone want a removable sump tray? Uh, so I have got a Morosso sump that we have fitted to our 350Z. So right now, I can hope that they are good. Uh, I mean, essentially, there's not a lot of technology in these sumps, though. They, they are a pretty basic thing. And and uh, short of having an oil leak because they haven't been welded up properly, uh, they're, they're, there's sort of much of a muchness between the, the lot. And particularly uh, in our case, I know you've got a B18 there. Uh, in our case with the SR20, uh, the the aftermarket sumps available from the likes of Tomei and uh, Morosso are all pretty much a copy of the same design, so they all look exactly the same. Uh, in terms of a removable sump tray, not 100% sure what you're talking about there. In um, some engines, there will be a baffle plate, uh, which is what I'd refer to it as, that bolts into the engine, uh, or a windage tray, sorry, uh, which is what I'd refer to it as, that bolts into the engine, designed to essentially help remove oil from the crank shaft or prevent oil uh, getting onto the crank shaft. Not sure if that's what you're talking about there. Craig has asked, uh, would the first place to upgrade a factory dry sump be a larger oil tank, uh, sorry, uh, to upgrade a factory dry sump, be a larger oil tank or a deeper oil pan. Okay, uh, so if you are running a dry sump, then the oil pan itself is almost irrelevant in terms of its depth. Uh, one of the advantages with the dry sump system is because we don't have to store the oil in the sump of the engine, uh, we don't need anywhere near as much depth. And so this is the advantage we see in a lot of single seat race cars, cars is that uh, going to a dry sump system allows the engine to be fitted much lower in the chassis because we've got no problems with clearance to the ground. So uh, that's not to say the sump design doesn't matter. Uh, quite often it's quite intricate with the way the scavenge pickups are integrated and also uh, there will often be some mesh screens to prevent uh, any engine components being picked up by those scavenge pumps in the event that you do have an engine failure. Dry sump pumps are pretty pricey. You don't want to be ruining them by ruining them by putting a piece of broken piston through one. Uh, so really, I mean, it depends, Craig, on what your problems with your dry sump system are. Um, most factory systems will be designed pretty well, I would imagine, uh, if you're starting to get uh, too much heat into your oil, that's one issue. You'd probably be looking at adding an, a larger oil cooler. A larger sump, uh, sorry, a larger capacity tank would be another option. But um, yeah, I, I've, I've yet to see any real problems that I'd need to upgrade from a factory dry sump, a factory dry sump system. Uh, Jameson Evo has asked any insight on keeping or blocking piston oil squirters on a drag street 4G63 Evo 8 also an experience with underdrive oil pump gear like the one sold by English Racing for the 4G63 using an increased Morosso pan and deleted balance shafts ok uh, so all of the 4G63 engines that I ever built we did retain the under piston oil squirters I know that some engine builders prefer to remove them on the basis that uh, you are uh, potentially uh, removing some of the oil from the, the main oil gallery that could be used to feed the bearings. Uh, frankly, I just never had any issues with keeping them in there. And I would like the idea of the under piston oil squirters providing cooling oil to remove heat from the piston crown. So I think uh, on balance they are a good product, but I do know that um, many engine builders remove them and have no issues. It's just been my own personal experience. I uh, also had no experience with the underdrive oil pump gear. Unfortunately, I always ran the factory oil pump gear. One thing you need to be careful of with the 4G63 is the way you remove the balance shafts. Uh, a lot of people will just cut the balance shaft off the back of the driven gear on the oil pump. You don't want to do that. Uh, in some instances, it can be reliable. More often than not, though, over time, because that driven gear is no longer as well supported, it can actually gouge out the oil pump and result in a quite a cas catastrophic failure. Uh, so use a proper uh, balance shaft removal kit which still has full support for that driven gear. Jeremy has asked, is there a way to combat rev limiter aerating the oil? Uh, is there a limiter that doesn't jog the engine? Not 100% sure what you're uh, referring to there, Jeremy. Uh, I mean, essentially the oil 
pump is going to be uh, linked to our engine speed so our the oil flow through the engine is obviously relevant to the engine RPM. Uh, I have never personally seen anything that I'd link in terms of oil aeration specifically to a type of rev limiter so sorry I can't probably give you too much more there, not, not an issue that I've come across. Uh, Alan has asked can you use a wet sump on an everyday driven built motor? Absolutely. Uh, through my old workshop where we built hundreds of engines for a variety of different cars, uh, I would say that less than 1% of the engines that we built were fitted with a dry sump system. Uh, in almost every road driven application, a dry, uh, oh, sorry, wet sump system, in most road applications a dry sump system would be complete overkill. Dry sump systems are really only the, the realms of engines that have really catastrophic uh, oiling problems, known oiling problems, or more likely uh, engines that are going to be used in a circuit application. Uh, Oliver has asked what are your thoughts on increasing oil capacity via an oil cooler? Uh, yeah I mean when you add an oil cooler by definition you're going to end up increasing the oil capacity by some amount. Uh, it's not a bad thing but it's not really achieving the same aim as a winged sump because the idea with the winged sump is you're collecting more oil around the oil pickup, the wing sump in conjunction with the baffles or the trap doors uh, should help keep that oil around the pickup so that's something that the oil cooler won't really help with even though you've got more capacity. Um, Jay has asked when turbocharging a factory NA engine that runs say 5W30 should the oil viscosity change after turbocharging? Uh, I assume you want some thicker viscosity but I don't know how to judge which one I would need. Okay so this really comes down to the specific engine and how far you're intending to push the engine. Personally yes I will almost always step up the oil viscosity if I go from a naturally aspirated build to a turbocharged or supercharged build. There are a few factors that come in here though. Uh, one of them is that if you are dealing with a late model engine that uses cam control and then the cam control system can be quite fussy uh, dependent on the oil viscosity that you are running. So basically what I mean here is if you go to a very heavy uh, viscosity oil you may find that the cam control is now lethargic and it has a lot of latency built into it. Uh, 5W30 isn't a bad grade of oil for a moderate turbocharged engine. Uh, you might want to step up just a little bit to maybe a 10W40, that's probably going to be a pretty good combination uh, in most instances I would think. Uh, C. Marion has asked in regards to rotary engine, uh, I've read that there can be issues with oil surge uh, out through the oil fillet neck with prolonged high RPM and particularly long right hand corners. Are you aware of this issue and what's the best way to deal with this? I've seen aftermarket filler necks but not sure if this is a band aid fix and not addressing the actual problem. Okay so rotary engines are something that I don't personally build and I've had a limited experience with rotary engines in a circuit application so I don't know for certain if that is an issue uh, and, and it may well be this is a, a common problem on a variety of engines where at sustained high RPM under cornering uh, oil may end up in a, in a specific area of the engine that you don't want it. Uh, in terms of the uh, oil design though the rotary engine is still uh, fairly fairly similar in terms of the oil pump and pickup uh, so I would probably be considering there a baffled sump with a little bit more capacity. I'm not sure about the aftermarket filler next again just something I haven't dealt with myself. Uh, Daniel Hoyes asked um, what's your opinion on building your own oil pan for the barra into a JZA 70 chassis because hurdle being building my own pickup tube uh, made me more of a square squared tubing design to lower the overall depth of the entire setup. Um, yeah, and engine swaps can be a little bit tricky because now you are kind of trying to design a sump that may be compromised in terms of actually fitting into the new chassis around the cross member, etc. Uh, really, I mean, you, you want to keep in, in, in mind the same design principles that we've already talked about today. Uh, you want to add capacity where you can. Uh, a winged sump design, if you can add that around the pickup, is a good idea. Uh, try and get the pickup uh, to sit nice and close to the base of the sump, we don't want that any higher than it needs to be or we risk running into uh, problems with oil surge even earlier than we potentially could and then of course uh, trap doors or uh, the little rubber flaps to try and help the oil stay around the pickup.
Uh, Maddie has asked, uh, can different oil filters cause different oil pressure? Yeah, quite potentially. Uh, I mentioned just a little bit earlier that uh, there, there's likely to be an uh, oil pressure drop across the filter element. Pretty, pretty common. Uh, what we will almost certainly be doing though is measuring the oil pressure as it goes into the engine. That's the important part. That's what the engine is seeing. So that's what we want to be measuring there. But uh, yeah, def definitely uh, I, I would recommend always using a high quality filter uh, on a competition car or any performance engine. Um, Jared has asked, are you using an AN cap as a drain plug on the modified oil pan? Yeah, absolutely. It was just a nice, easy way of adding uh, an oil drain. So that's just a dash 10 AN fitting there. Um, John has asked, synthetic 20W50, is that worth it for turbo cars or conventional is better? Uh, okay, so I probably should clarify here, I am not an oil specialist. Uh, what I know has just come from my own experience with testing different oils, mainly in our own drag car program. Uh, what we ended up settling on was Motul's range of 300V full synthetic oils. This isn't a paid advert for Motul. We pay for our oil just like probably every one of you. So uh, this isn't a, a, a an ad campaign for Modal. I just personally found from pulling my own engine down and looking at the results after a race meeting, we tried a variety of different oils and the Modal 300V basically increased our engine life or bearing life by uh, a factor of about five. So that was enough for me. Uh, but yeah, I'm not an oil specialist, so can't really give you too much more on that, unfortunately. Uh, John's also asked opinions on an oil scraper. So these are a, a, a design that's intended to uh, prevent or remove the oil from the crankshaft as it spins through the crankcase. Uh, and you're going to get what's referred to as windage losses from that oil. Uh, again, I haven't done any back-to-back -back tests on these. They make a lot of sense. I know that they are a very common uh, option. They're using a lot of competition engines. So yeah, probably worthwhile if you've got the ability to build one or buy one for your car, your engine. Justin has asked, any tips to reduce wet sump pump cavitation at high RPM? Okay, so... <sighs> If you've got pump cavitation, I'm going to guess that you are pushing well past the rev limit of your factory engine. Uh, so at some point, the pump essentially is going to cavitate and start pumping air. If that actually happens, then you've got some serious problems because it's going to no longer be pumping uh, uh, high pressure oil through your engine and you are going to have problems with your bearing. So this is really all about uh, making sure that the components you are using are going to suit your aim. And if you've got an engine where the factory pump is known to be an issue at high RPM, uh, then what I would recommend is either swapping to an aftermarket pump or you may look at it having to fit an external oil pump. So that's kind of along the lines of the dry sump system, but you can fit an external oil pump without actually having to go to a full dry sump system as well. Uh, Marlo has asked, thoughts on thoughts behind using a half wet sump, dry sump, i.e. The, using the factory oil pump plumb to an external tank and have an electric, electronic scavenge pumps moving oil from the wet sump into the dry sump tank reservoir. Okay, uh, not something that I've investigated, Marlo. Uh, what I would initially say there is my concern would be the ability of the factory pump to draw the oil all the way from the dry sump tank. Uh, so if you look at the size of a factory oil pump, versus the pressure pump in a dry sump uh, pump, they're dramatically different, different in size and they're designed for very, very different things. So I would be fearful that if you tried using a factory oil pump to draw the oil uh, all the way forward from your dry, dry sump reservoir, which may in some instances be in the, in the uh, rear of the car in the trunk and the boot, uh, you could be trying to draw that oil maybe uh, you know, sort of 10 or 12 feet or further and I just don't think that's going to work very well. Um, so Jeremy has asked, uh, okay, sorry, just clarifying a question from earlier. Does hitting the rev limiter lower the oil pressure? Okay, so um, no, it, it shouldn't. Again, basically the rev limiter, you're holding your RPM constant. So the RPM of the engine also relates to the RPM of the oil pump. So you should see relatively consistent oil pressure uh, when you hit the, the rev limiter. 
Right, okay, I think that, yeah, sorry, I'm just, just making sure that I've read all of that correctly. All right, guys, that has brought us to the end of the webinar. So hopefully that's given you a little bit more insight into some of the options available for uh, modifying a factory wet sump system, showing you that uh, it's not always necessary to shell out a huge amount of money to build a or to set up a dry sump system, particularly on a streetcar. Uh, there's some pretty good options there if you are a little bit creative and uh, you want to start getting your hands dirty and making something yourself. Uh, if if you have got any other questions please feel free to ask them on the forum and I'll be happy to answer them there. Thanks for joining us and I look forward to seeing you all next time. That was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. Click the link in the description to learn more.